Good morning. Uh, today we'll start a chapter that will be related to semiconductors and uh, we'll be discussing diodes, uh, the use of diodes in rectifiers and then voltage regulators and DC-DC uh, convergers. Uh, we will start with uh, an introduction into semiconductors. Um, semiconductors are materials uh, in the third and fourth and fifth group of the periodic table. Uh, so here you have a selection of uh, semiconductor materials. Uh, so the basic material here is in the fourth group, silicon. That's a typical uh, semiconductor material. But uh, there are other materials as well, like germanium. It's also used for special applications. And uh, also carbon. So, for example, carbon, diamond, is also a semiconductor. So, uh, those are the basic materials uh, that are used uh, in a semiconductor production. And uh, the semiconductor materials from the fourth group are being doped by uh, the elements from the third and fifth group of the periodic table. So, uh, by boron, aluminium, gallium and indium, eventually. So this forms uh, the uh, p-type semiconductors and here uh, if you dope that with the elements from the fifth group uh, you will create an n-type uh, semiconductor. So uh, a p-type semiconductor has uh, one electron less than the basic material so this is those fourth group elements they have four electrons in the outer shell and uh, those have three so there's one missing when you make an alloy and here uh, the fifth group elements they have one electron plus so they have five electrons in the in the last uh, in the last position so uh, they are negative and they have one electron plus uh, so if you create a semiconductor material uh, we will be not looking for uh, the properties of a single semiconductor but we will be always looking on the properties of the p-n junction so uh, we have to create uh, a connection of uh, p-type semiconductor and n-type semiconductor and this will have the desired properties for diodes and uh, transistors and integrated circuits later on uh, so what happens here? Uh, we have, let's say we have initially uh, a piece of n-type semiconductor and we have a piece of p-type semiconductor. Those may be individual pieces or it may be uh, a single piece of the basic material, silicon for example, uh, where you uh, dope one region with the n-type elements and the other region with p-type elements. Or it may be, uh, for example, P-type basic material semiconductor and uh, you dope that with N-type N -type elements. Uh, so initially, let's say we have an two separate pieces. Here in the N-type semiconductor, those black dots are the elements that form the basic uh, basic. Uh, um, material so this could be silicon for example and here those those green circles represent electrons so uh, this is the area uh, where you have added the extra atoms from the fifth group and uh, in this area you have an extra electron that is, that is free and this is coming from the p type uh, from the n type uh, n type element uh, the same happens also in uh, the p-type semiconductor so again we have the basic material so that's the the black dots are the, the, the silicon and uh, here those red areas the pluses represent the places where you have replaced uh, the silicon atom or added another atom uh, of the of the p-type the third or the third group so in this area uh, you have one uh, electron missing and uh, that's 
represented here by the pluses. Uh, you can imagine it like it would be an area where you have a positive charge. But in reality, it is a lack of the negative charge. Uh, so now we take those two pieces uh, and we connect them together. There are many methods how this connection is done. Mm, you could also, uh, let's say, fuse uh, this area and, and add them together. Uh, you could uh, shoot individual atoms in the basic material. So there are many ways how to do that. Uh, but at the end, you have one piece of uh, material. This will be our PN junction. And uh, in this PN junction, uh, we have a region with a surplus of negative charge, and we have a region uh, where you have a surplus of positive charge. And in the middle, you have a region uh, where the negative charge and the positive charge will recombine and this will create so-called intri intrinsic region where you have no charge at all, so no free charge at all. So uh, when you create a p-n junction like this, then uh, the electrons are trapped in this region and in this region. And they cannot travel without any external help uh, between those regions. So this acts like an insulation and uh, we will see that it will have a, the following effect, that it will act as a rectifier, it will limit the movement of charge only in a single direction. Um, so uh, we will use this uh, PN junction in diodes. So diodes are components where uh, we have a single PN junction. We will later, next week, we'll be talking about transistors or we ha will have two p-n junctions. Uh, now, you see here, I have added uh, an external power supply. This external power supply uh, and its polarity will determine if the charge can pass from p to n or from, p or, uh, or from n to p or vice versa. So now, if we look uh, on the connection of this PN junction, uh, we are able to do it in both ways. Uh, we can have a negative terminal here and positive terminal over there, or we, we can change the polarity, and uh, this will tell us if the current is flowing or if the current is being blocked by this intrinsic, intrinsic region. Um, so how do we use that in a diode? A diode is a component uh, with a single p-n junction. Uh, here you have uh, a schematic mark of the diode. So you will find this in schematics. And uh, here you see we have uh, the positive terminal, the anode, which is created from the p semiconductor. And here we have the cathode, the negative terminal, and that's uh, the n-type semiconductor. The current in the diode is flowing only in one direction. So it's flowing only from the anode to the cathode. The reason for this is that uh, initially, when people were discovering how those materials and electronics, how, how it works, uh, the idea was that electrical current is the flow of positive charge. So here it we look like it's flowing from the positive side to the negative side, but in fact the electron flow is exactly in the opposite direction. So although we still keep this convention that current is flowing from plus to minus, in reality the electrons are flowing from minus to plus. But this is for historical reasons, so uh, an anode is a positive electrode and we say the current is flowing in that direction. Uh, so now imagine we have a diode connected like this in a circuit. So when the voltage on the diode is positive, so the anode has a higher voltage than the cathode, the current can flow. So there will be current flowing in this direction. 
when we reverse the current of voltage, so that here we would have higher voltage than, than here, then the current will be blocked. Uh, the reason why it is blocked is visible, well, I, I, I come back to this chart, but here I have uh, a nice animation uh, that is um, maybe visualizing uh, quite well what is happening in the diode. So we will see uh, we'll have uh, three cases here. I'm unfortunately, I'm not able to stop the animation. But here, uh, this is forward. Well, this was. Let's wait on until it's back. So now this is a diode in a forward bias direction. So here, uh, we will have uh, a voltage that is polarized in such a way that the current, the electrons, can flow. So you see that the small dots are the electrons and the large circles that represents the fictional positive charge. In other words, that's the lack of negative charge, the electrons in, in the place. So when the, uh, when the diode is forward biased, I have a positive voltage between the anode and cathode, and the electrons can flow between the p-n junction. And uh, in this chart, it is represented in this quadrant. Here, I have a positive voltage. This is called forward voltage, and it's the voltage that you measure on the diode. And here, we have the current that is flowing through the diode, and uh, in this quadrant, it is called forward current. Uh, the typical curve looks like this. Uh, there is a very small voltage, and until you reach this voltage, the forward current is very small. It is virtually zero. It is also called a threshold voltage. In other words, uh, until the voltage is higher than the threshold voltage, the current is almost not flowing through the diode. So this is this this is this area in the chart. Uh, the forward threshold voltage uh, depends on the material from which the diode is made, and uh, for silicon volt diodes, the typical voltage uh, of this point of this threshold is roughly 0 0.7 volts. If you use germanium, then it's smaller. It's zero, roughly 0 0.3 volts. But more typical are silicon diodes, so you need to count that the minimal voltage is roughly 0 0.7 volts. If you keep increasing the voltage after this threshold, the current is increasing quite rapidly. So uh, the voltage that you increase is almost not increasing at all, and the forward current is uh, increasing very rapidly. So we operate the diode in this forward direction. So this is the direction where the current can flow. Now if we polarize the, di the diode in a, a rev reverse direction. So it means that uh, we have a negative voltage. So the higher voltage is on the cathode and smaller voltage is on the anode. Then in an ideal diode, the current flowing through the diode would be exactly zero. So uh, if you look on, on uh, let's say on, on this chart, uh, if I polarize this in uh, the forward direction, then the electrons can flow and they are going over uh, this intrinsic region. But if I polarize that in the reverse direction, uh, I will, uh, let's say, suck out the charge from here and the charge from here, and the size of the intrinsic region will increase and there will be no current flowing. This is happening in an ideal diode. 
So by increasing the reverse voltage in an ideal diode, I increase this area where there is no charge, and no charge can flow at all. Um, maybe we'll be able to see that in this, in this animation. So when this is forward biased, we see that the electrons can flow. But if I reverse bias this diode, you see this area is increasing. I'm sucking out positive charge from here and, uh, neg yeah, and negative charge over there, the electrons, and the, the, the area is increasing. So an ideal diode uh, would not conduct any electrical current in the reverse direction. However, in the real world, there is nothing ideal. So uh, the materials are not pure and we are not able to create a material that will be only N-type and only P-type. Although the materials that we have are very, very pure, there are always some small impurities. And in this N-type region, you have very few, but they are still there, of areas where you have some impurity of P-type. So there will be some small areas where you still have charge, positive charge. And here, the same for P-type, there will be always some areas where you have impurities. And those impurities caused that there is, in fact, a very small current flowing also in the reverse direction. Simply because this is not purely n-type, but there are very few spots of, of p, and here you have a very few spots of n. So there is a small current flowing also in the re reverse direction. So a typical diode has a reverse current. Uh, you see here the current can be very small. And this is not in scale. You see here, it's in milliamperes. So the forward current is much larger than the reverse current. And here, uh, the reverse current is in microamperes. So uh, it's like three orders of magnitude, at least smaller. So this is the part here. So it may seem larger than, but here the, 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 that's a zoom. If you keep increasing the reverse voltage, you are adding, let's say, stress on the PN junction. And at one voltage, this PN junction will break down. So uh, you will create a permanent destruction in the PN junction. It will be an area where the current will flow in both directions. So if you increase uh, this voltage above a certain limit, then the diode will be destroyed and there will be a large reverse current as well. If you do this on a normal diode, then this is a permanent damage. So it means that you will destroy the, damage, the, the diode and you will have a current in the forward direction and the current in the reverse direction. Uh, there are special diodes with a special construction that are called Zener diode or avalanche diodes that are resistant to this damage in the reverse direction. And uh, in fact, those Zener diodes are used only in this reverse direction. We'll see also some applications, but you see here that I'm trying to increase the voltage and the current is staying, uh, I, I'm increasing the current and the voltage is staying the same, almost. So uh, Zener diodes uh, can be used as voltage regulators, for example, in a special connection. But the construction is different and we'll not talk too much about that here. Okay, so uh, let's see some examples of uh, the diodes. How is the component looking like? 
So I have here just a few pictures of uh, different sizes of diodes. Uh, here you have always marked the cathode and anode because for a diode it's crucial that you polarize that in the correct direction. We will be using diodes uh, as rectifiers and therefore we need to orient them so that the current can flow in the direction that we want. So here you have an example of a relatively small diode. This black strip here is the mark for a cathode. It's always marked in some way. So typically a black strip like that or a white strip like that if the package is black. Uh, in some cases it's also possible to recognize that by the length of the leads. So uh, one lead is longer, one lead is shorter. Uh, so those diodes are called small signal diodes and they are typically for small currents. Um, this could be for 10 milliamperes, this could be for 100 milliamperes or one ampere, depends on the size. Uh, and for larger currents you have obviously larger devices. Uh, so this is uh, a diode uh, that is good for, you see, 100 amperes current. So the larger current requires a larger surface of the PN junction. There are always losses on the diode and uh, you can calculate the losses. You can calculate the losses even from this characteristic. How much heat will be produced on the diode depends on the voltage and on the current. So here if I am in this area, I have a uh, small current and I have relatively small voltage. So the losses will be, will be small here. But if I am above this knee, uh, let's say this will be 100 ampere and this will be 1 volt. So the power, 100 ampere times 1 volt will be 100 watts. So I need to cool down 100 watts on the diode and this means I need a larger surface I need a heat sink and I need a cooling. So for larger currents uh, we have power diodes that are large, uh, typically look like this. They are typically encased uh, in a metallic casing so that the uh, conduction of the heat from the PN junction into the ambient environment is quite good. And we typically mount them on a heat sink for example. We may have cooling, we may have fans and so on. I have some examples here of uh, different diodes. So uh, let's say this is a small signal diode. So this is for small power. And uh, here I have uh, a dip the, same, the same diode but uh, in surface mount package. So the, as the same like we have discussed for resistors, capacitors and inductors, uh, you can get the components with the terminals or you can get them without terminals and this is soldered into the printed circuit board with the terminal or if it's a surface mounted component then it's soldered on top without without those, those wires. Um, the rating for voltage and current is typically the same, uh, although when the component is sitting directly on the printed circuit board, uh, the cooling is better, so uh, you can have a little bit higher currents. Uh, for larger currents, something like this, uh, I have an example here. Uh, this is a rectifier bridge, so um, it is uh, for it, it combines four diodes in a single package and uh, this is for 250 volts and the current is somewhere around 2, maybe 4 amperes. So it, it's a larger device um, for larger voltages and larger currents. Um, so now Let's take a look on uh, the characteristics of the diode. So what can we expect 
and what can we uh, find in the data sheets. Um, this is an example of a small signal diode that, that is uh, good for smaller currents. Um, that's uh, roughly the, the first type I'm, I'm sending here. So something around, let's say, 200 milliamperes, maybe 300 milliamperes, smaller currents. And uh, this is a typical picture that you will find in the data sheet of this diode. So how, how to use that? Uh, first of all, we can read from the chart what is the threshold voltage of the diode. So this specific diode has the threshold voltage around here. So if you look on the scale, he, he, here we have 1 volt. Uh, somewhere here we have 0 0.5, so this is 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts. So this is definitely a silicon diode. Silicon, yes, silicon, 0 0.7. So we are, we are somewhere here, here, in this, in this, this is the position of the knee, so here is the 0 0.7 volt. So that's the threshold voltage. Uh, the current, after you increase this voltage, you see the current is sharply increasing and uh, the maximum voltage for this diode is roughly, let's say, 1.8 volts, something in this range. And here you have the current 450 milliamperes. Um, in the data sheet for the, the diode, you will find what is the maximum allowed current, what is the maximum allowed power flowing through this diode. Uh, here, you also see that the characteristic of the diode uh, depends on the temperature. Because when you increase the temperature in the PN junction, you see what happens here with the characteristic. So this curve, uh, number two, is the for 25 centigrades, is a typical curve. So it's the, let's say the average curve. But if I increase the temperature to 175 centigrades, the characteristic will shift, the voltage will be smaller, and for the same voltage, I have, uh, I have a smaller current. Larger current, sorry. Here, for the same voltage, I have this current and this current is here. So for a smaller volt voltage, I have larger current that is flowing through the diode. Uh, this is the temperature of the junction, so it's not the temperature of the diode that will be have that will have to be smaller, but it's the junction temperature. The typical junction temperature for silicon devices, say the maximum temperature without damage, is somewhere in the order of 120 up to 170 centigrades. So if you heat the diode to higher temperatures, we will destroy the PN junction due to thermal overheat. There are other materials that uh, are more resistant to higher temperatures. For example, today there are modern components, not just from silicon, but from a mixture of silicon carbide, which are good for higher temperatures. But still, we are in the range of 150, 180 centigrades. So electronic components, uh, they do not work at all, or they do not work well for a longer time for higher temperatures. The marking of a diode looks typically like this. One, let's say 1N, and then there is a number, and this number, thi this whole code, is saying you, okay, this is this diode type. I will briefly open uh, the uh, whole data sheet for this diode so that you just have an idea what all you can find in the data sheet. So, uh, let's see. Uh, 
let's see some data sheet. For example, I just opened the same the same data diode. Uh, so this is how typically a data sheet looks like. So here you see the diode. This is uh, the cathode, and this is the anode. Uh, we may find information about uh, the maximum reverse voltage, for example. So the, the, the absolute maximum rating table is typically right on the first page. So here you see that this diode has a maximum reverse voltage of 75 volts. After that, you will destroy that. Uh, we see that it has uh, two amperes peak forward surge current. It means the cu current can be a peak of this amplitude, but there typically as is a limitation how long this, this peak can, can last. And that the f continuous current in the forward direction is 300 milliamperes. So if you cool it correctly, uh, you can use this diode with a current of 300 milliamperes. For a really short period of time, the peak you see here, one microsecond, can be up to two amperes, and then the thermal damage will destroy the diode. Uh, it's related here with the power dissipation. You see 440 milliwatts. That's the voltage times current on the diode. Uh, if you need to calculate uh, the cooling, uh, you need thermal parameters. So here, for example, you have a thermal resistance uh, between the junction, between the junction and between the uh, the casing. So this value helps you to calculate if you need a heatsink for a current or not. And here we see the junction temperature up to 100, 175 centigrades. If that would be a different element, it may be lo lower or higher, just a little bit. And here you have a table uh, with typical values. So here we have uh, a 4 volt voltage. That's the point in the volt ampere characteristic. So this is how it looks like. So this is voltage and this is current. And you see now they specify us that if my current is 10 milliamperes, then I will have the voltage of, uh, of one volt. So this can be used as well to calculate the, the heat dissipation because power is voltage times current. So it would be uh, one, uh, 10 milliamperes times one volt, which should be 10 milliwatts in, the, in this case. If I keep increasing uh, the current, the voltage will increase. So this will be going up and up. And I am limited by the value of the power dissipation. Uh, here uh, we see, for example, the reverse current. This is specified for 20 volts. So for 20 volts uh, of reverse voltage, the reverse current is maximum 25 nanoamperes. So it's like six orders of magnitude smaller than the reverse current. Here is the forward current. Here you see 10 milliamperes. But reverse current is smaller. But it's not zero, definitely. Uh, we see also, for example, diode capacitance. Uh, it's a property of the diode, and uh, it's saying us that the diode is not perfect. If you connect that in a circuit, it may act as a capacitor, and although the capacitor looks small for picofarad, then for some applications this may be too large. So there are diodes that have this value smaller, um, but typical rectifier diodes, they you don't look for this parameter uh, because you are interested in knowing the current. Uh, here you see an interesting chart. This is saying you how much is the, uh, is the uh, forward voltage dependent on the temperature. 
So if I pass a current of this size through the diode, then the voltage that I measure, that is specified in the table on top, uh, is a function of temperature. So in other words, if I would uh, push a constant current through the diode, let's say 0 0.1 milliampere, so 100 microamperes, and I would measure the forward voltage, the diode itself would act as a temperature sensor. So diodes are also used as temperature sensors, simply because if the forward voltage is dependent on the junction temperature. And the function is nice and linear, so that's one way how you can measure temperature. Um, what else do we have? Well, nothing more, but just here uh, the idea of the size of the diode. Uh, so a cathode mark over there, and here you have an idea about the size. Those values uh, are in, in millimeters, so this specific diode has 3.4 millimeters, uh, the length. The terminals are longer. You solder that into the board, and then you cut the, uh, the terminals to, to the length. Um, but just out of curiosity, open uh, some data sheet for a silicon power diode, so a silicon rectifier. I just open um, a random diode. So, I don't know, let's say, for example, this one doesn't really matter, we'll see just the parameters data sheet okay. so this is a random data sheet for a power diode uh, you see the package is larger uh, the one I have just opened is a surface mounted component, so it sits on top of the board and those terminals are directly soldered to the board. When it sits on top of the board, it uses the board as a cooler, so it will have higher current. The package is larger. We see here uh, we have six, current, six amperes forward current. Uh, reverse voltage 600 volts and forward voltage 1.5. Uh, this operating temperature for the junction is the same. Um, here, just to give you an idea about the limitations, so the continuous current is 6 amperes, but uh, oh they, they say here in this, uh, they say 14, 14.7. Uh, if the junction or casing is 90 degrees, then it's lower current, so it's 10 amperes only. And uh, here you see that non-repetitive current, so a single peak ampli amplitude for 25 milliseconds can be up to 29 amperes. So roughly two times higher than the continuous current. That's a typical value. And um, let's see some some charts. Well, for example, this is interesting. Here you see thermal resistance between junction and case. We have 3.2 kelvins per watt. If you remember uh, the, va the value from the previous diode, it had like 320. So it means that this has a, a much smaller thermal resistance. It's a different package and the heat is being dissipated much easier, much more easily uh, into the environment than in the previous package. So this is typical for power diodes that they have. Uh, we want that they have a low value of thermal resistance because we want to dissipate a large amount of heat. For the small signal diodes, uh, the current typically passing through the diode is small, and they don't dissipate virtually no heat at all. You will find here 
the volt ampere characteristic. So again, there is a knee like this. This is a 0 0.7 volts. Uh, that's for a silicon diode. Uh, we see that the shape of the characteristic depends again on temperature. So if the environment is really hot, then uh, this will be somewhere around here. And if I have that in a cold environment or, or if I cool it down uh, very efficiently, then I will have a smaller voltage drop and higher current over there. Um, but just out of curiosity, open. If I will just find, I, I don't, didn't didn't look. Uh, if I'm able to find some germanium diodes and their data sheets, just to look for the characteristics. But they don't say it here. Let me look for a different one. Well, it, it's not in the data sheets I just found. They, they don't say it, but here you see for 5 milliamperes, for voltage drop is maximum uh, 1 volt. If we compare that uh, to the previous diode, the silicon one, which we had, which we had here, so here we had 10 milliamperes and 1 volt as well. So the current is doubled, but the voltage st stays the same. OK, so now, now let's take a look on the applications of diodes. Uh, we will first discuss a special kind of diode uh, that is used uh, for voltage regulators just to understand the principle uh, of uh, how we can control voltage or how we can con keep the voltage on a constant level. So a zener diode is a diode that has a special construction and this special construction is active in the reverse direction. So in the forward direction it, it looks like a normal diode. We have this type of characteristic, but the Zener diode is not used in the forward direction. We used the, di the Zener diode in the reverse direction simply because this characteristic, when you have very small current and then you have almost constant voltage, is reversible. So it means that the Zener diodes does not break if you polarize that in the reverse direction and the Zener diode is operated somewhere in this area. Here we still have an area where you may destroy the diode. So this is when you apply a too high voltage. So this is not reversible, but this is re a reversible area. So how do we use as an diode uh, to control the voltage. Well, we will operate the diode in this area, and in this area we see that uh, I increase the current and the voltage is almost not increasing at all. There is a small increase, but it's very small. So we will connect the diode in such a way that it's operated always in this area. 
So the Zener diode will be reversed, biased, and we will connect our load to the Zener diode in parallel, and the voltage will be almost constant. So this is the circuit. Here we have a voltage on the input that can be unregulated, so this voltage may change in some range. This is the Zener dial itself, and you see there is a Zener current, IZ, that is flowing through the diode. So this Zener current is what is flowing here, so in this in this area we have this current in my chart from 1 to 7 microamperes but if you have a different diode it will be different and in order to set this current we have this serial resistor so its power supply is connected here and this resistor sets the current that is flowing through the diode so that we are operating in the correct area of the chart and this is the load this is where I take out the, vol the voltage and if we uh, look on this chart I said we are we are somewhere in this region of the, of the characteristic so here you see that regardless of the current I have and almost the same voltage. So this connection will work as a voltage regulator and create a controlled voltage, regulated voltage, out from an unregulated voltage. So for example, uh, this may be 12 volts plus minus 2 volts or 3 volts, and here uh, we will have 5 volts and it will be in some boundaries it will be independent of the load current and of the load that we connect here. So this is one way how we can use a diode as a voltage regulator. It's a Zener diode. Uh, this connection is quite simple but uh, as we will see at the end of the lecture it has a really low efficiency uh, because you waste all the extra power that you have on the input on the diode and on this resistor so the typical efficiency of this kind of Zener diode voltage regulator is somewhere around 20 percent maybe not more so if you need higher efficiency you need a more complicated connection or we'll see that today as well another usage of uh, diodes is to have diodes as rectifiers yes silicon silicon so another use of a diode is a rectifier if you have AC voltage and you want to create DC voltage then uh, you need a rectifier those diodes in the rectifiers are normal diodes so it's not Zener diode but it's a normal silicon diode on the input here we have an AC voltage sinusoidal voltage and uh, since we know that the diode is blocking the flow of current the current can flow only in one direction so the current can flow only when this terminal anode is positive and this terminal cathode is negative so the current can flow only when the voltage here is positive so if I look on the current flowing through this diode here, input voltage is sinusoidal, but the output voltage and output current will not be sinusoidal, but 
it will be only the positive part of the sinusoidal voltage. So it's taking a half of the wave. So this connection is called a half wave rectifier. So this is the load, this is the voltage, it's a half of this wave, so it's this area and it's this area. And this negative part of the input voltage is blocked. So I'm taking just this, then there's zero, then this, then there's zero. Since we know that the diode is not ideal, we have a voltage drop at the diode. The voltage here needs to be higher than the threshold voltage, so higher than the 0 0.7 volts. And uh, the typical drop on the diode here is roughly 1 volt. We've seen in the data sheet that the diodes have typically a 4 volt voltage for nominal current, something around 1 volt. So in this connection, uh, there will be a voltage drop over there. So the voltage at the output is a little bit smaller than the input voltage. Um, I will open a circuit simulation that I have prepared and that you can try it out at home. And we'll see uh, what will happen when we start the simulation, when we play with the component values. So, this is it. Here I have an AC voltage and I have chosen a voltage uh, with frequency 50 Hz and amplitude 10 volts for no reason at all. But 50 Hz I have chosen because it's a power supply frequency but the 10 volts, there's no reason for that. Here I have a diode and this is the load. There is a third component here, a capacitor, and we'll see what effect that will have. Uh, right now the capacitor is very small, so that there virtually is no capacitor in the circuit. If I run that with such a small capacitor, we'll see that the input voltage is sinusoidal and the output voltage will be the rectified half wave. So this blue curve is the voltage, and now when it's positive, the output voltage, the black curve, is okay. We have this. Then when the voltage is negative, here we have blocked the voltage. And here you see the small difference between the input voltage and output voltage, and that's the voltage drop on the diode. So this will translate itself into losses in the circuit, in the diode. So the diode will heat and you need to cool it down. This? Yes. The voltage drop on the diode. That's, that's, uh, that's visible here. There is current passing through the diode, so there will be some voltage drop on the diode. And then uh, in the circuit, if I, let's, let's see. So there is a voltage here on the diode, plus the voltage here on the, di on the road needs to give you the voltage from the power supply. So the, the drop is the voltage here on the diode typically one volt. So now, what will happen uh, if I add a capacitor in the circuit? So now, we here we see uh, this is a pulsating voltage, so it's not really a DC val value. But I'm looking for a constant voltage. I want that this produces a constant voltage. So I can connect a capacitor here in parallel to the load and uh, the capacitor will act as a storage for the energy when I am blocking this voltage. So in this area I will discharge the capacitor here and I will charge it here when 
the current is flowing through the diode. So if I do this in my simulation, we see what will be the effects. So let me now, let's say, let's try 100 nanofarads. Okay, so you see it's a small capacity, nothing has changed, nothing is visible, no change is visible in the circuit. But if I add, for example, 100, let's say 100 microfarads, uh, we should see a difference. Okay, that's it, here. So, in this part, the capacitor is charging, we can increase the voltage. So here, at this part of the voltage, I'm the load is taking energy from the power supply and the capacitor is being charged at the same time. And here, the capacitor is being discharged. In this circuit, it's an RC circuit, so this is an exponential curve. The input is disconnected, it's blocked by the diode, and here, this is discharge voltage on the capacitor. So now if I keep increasing the capacitor value, it will be a bigger buffer, so when it's charged, it will discharge slower. Let me do that. Let's see what will happen if I say it's 500 microfarads. Okay, see the difference? So now the voltage is dropping, S the voltage drop is smaller for a larger capacitor. So if I would like to have a really good halfway rectifier, I will need to have a really, really huge capacitor, which will be large in size. So uh, let's let's see what happens if I uh, take a really large value, so instead of 500 micro, I will use 500 millifarads. And now we see something different. So now when I start the connection, here it's charging the capacitor, still charging. Now I'm discharging the capacitor, but since it's really large, the drop is small. It's almost not visible at all. Here at the second half wave I will charge it again to a little bit higher voltage, then discharge, higher voltage and so on and so on. So if I uh, would run this for a longer time then the capacitor voltage would remain constant and it would be a very good rectifier because it would give me a constant voltage at the output. But the 500 uh, millifarad capacitor would be very large. So here is a trade-off between the size of your device and between how good you produce the voltage. If we would look on the current that is flowing through the circuit, we'll also see that there is a dependence between the size of the capacitor and the current. So let me add the current flowing Let's say current flowing through the diode here. So now this will be a current. And you see, that's now it's the, the green thing. I have chosen a really large capacitor. And now initially the capacitor is discharged. So initially I'm charging an empty capacitor. And you see that here, the peak of the current is huge. I have 200, 200 amperes. So if I have uh, this connection, and I would have a diode for 0 0.5 amperes, this would definitely burn the diode out. So I would need to add protection in the circuit. But since we are increasing the voltage in the circuit, then the peak in the current is decreasing, and then at the end it would be very, very small. Now if I decrease back the 
capacitor value, then we'll see that the current will get smaller. Uh, now those those uh, those oscillations, those peak peaks, are due to the setting of the simulation. In reality, it's not there. In reality, you have this kind of peak, but this is caused by the step in the simulation size. Uh, so here is we see that the I have decreased thousand times the capacitor, and now uh, the peak value of the current dropped to 1.5 only, so from 200. So by making a less perfect output voltage, I have limited the current. So it's another trade-off. If you want a perfect constant voltage, uh, take a larger capacitor, but then you will have a really huge spike on the beginning, and you may have other components in the connection to limit that. Okay, so that's a single wave or half wave rectifier. Uh, here, for this kind of circuit, you see that we are not using very efficiently the available input power. Here, I have used only one half of the voltage that I, that I had. And this part when the voltage was negative, was completely blocked and uh, was not used at all in the circuit. So there is a more efficient connection where we will use the energy available here and here as well. This connection is a bridge rectifier, but this rectifier requires four diodes. We need four diodes to allow the flow of current in one direction and then uh, another two diodes to allow the current flow in the other direction. We still want to keep the constant voltage at the output. So the output load represented here by a resistor, we want that the voltage on the load is constant. There will be a smoothing capacitor but here the, the smoothing capacitor can be smaller in capacity since we will be charging it in both directions. So the input voltage is still an AC voltage, a sinusoidal voltage, with some frequency and some amplitude. But now we have this kind of connection. Uh, let's say uh, the voltage is polarized in such a way that here we have plus and here we have minus. So here I have plus. The current can flow in this direction because this diode is forward biased. So the current can flow through this diode, through the load, and now it can flow, uh, it can flow in this direction to this diode and back to the power supply. I try to represent the picture here. So uh, in red color, the current is flowing through D1, through the load, through D2, and back to the power supply. So in the forward direction, and when the voltage is positive, uh, I have opened diodes D1 and D2 and the current is flowing through them. The other diodes here are blocked because the voltage is negative. And uh, if I reverse the voltage, then diodes, uh, here you see diodes D3 and diode D4 will be open and the two others will be closed. So this connection uses both directions of the voltage. So uh, if the input is a sinusoidal, I'm using both, w both ways, both directions, and I am charging the capacitor more frequently. So at the end, the capacitor can be smaller because the voltage drop will be smaller as well. So this is when the capacitor is being charged, and this is where it's being discharged. Now here it looks like a linear function, but we know that it's an exponential function. 
and we can calculate the value of uh, the capacitor if we know what is our desired ripple of the voltage. So let's say I have this voltage, it will be always a ripple voltage, but I want a specific value. I want that delta T is, let's say, 0 0.2 volts. So I can calculate the value of the capacitor from this equation. This equation assumes that the capacitor is being discharged in a linear way and it's a simplification. So it's, this is not an exact formula, but it's an approximate formula. But if you know what will be the current of your load, what current that you need, you need to take, and T here is uh, the period of uh, the input voltage. So uh, in a 50 hertz network, it's 1 over 50 hertz. And this, if you know this, you can calculate C. So this allows you to design the rectifier if you know what voltage you would like to have. Uh, let's take a look on a circuit simulation. The circuit simulation again is available for you. You can try it out yourself. And uh, we'll play with the values of the capacitor. So here you see I have 10 volts, 50 hertz AC. Here I have a bridge rectifier, so four diodes of some specific type, doesn't matter here. This is the load and this is the capacitor. So I will start again with a small value of C, say virtually zero, 100 picofarads, and uh, we'll see what's the voltage. Uh, we will see that uh, the input voltage is sinusoidal. So the input voltage is this black curve that's from the power supply. And here, this blue is, uh, that's in fact, current because the current is flowing and it's flo following uh, the, the sinusoidal voltage. Uh, if I would put, let me add uh, the voltage here. So let's see. Uh -huh. uh, this simulator that unfortunately does not allow me uh, to measure voltage difference. So uh, I have measured voltage here, but it's the voltage on this point related to ground. I need to. I would need to measure voltage difference on the resistor. So since I'm measuring the voltage against ground, it looks like uh, a sinusoidal with with half of the part cut, but I'm I don't see the other wave. So I need to take a look on the current here. Let's see what happens if uh, we will change the value of capacitor. So let's try again. Mm, let's see. Let's see 100, 100 micro. 100 microfarads. So you see here I've started. Uh, the current is charging the capacitor. Now it is charging, charging and discharging and and so forth. But there is a voltage ripple. If I increase the current of uh, the capacitor, I will see that the ripple in the voltage will get smaller and smaller. So let's let's try five hundred. So now we see there is a smaller 
ripple here in the current and this will uh, mean a smaller ripple in voltage. So I have changed the capacitor value and this is again increasing or decreasing the, the voltage ripple. But here I'm using uh, the energy in both directions. You see here I'm charging the capacitor and here this corresponds to the negative part of the wave and I'm charging the capacitor here as well. So I'm using the energy more efficiently that I have available. If you want to create a bridge rectifier you can of course connect four diodes in this way but uh, there are already components available like the one you, you've seen here that group the four diodes in a single package. So at the end you have four terminals one, two, three and four at the package and you use that directly. So this is typical for smaller powers let's say two, five, ten amperes you can get those components uh, for larger currents, uh, you typically connect that with single diodes because single power diodes are quite massive and they are not manufactured as a one package of bridge rectifier, typically. Uh, this connection has uh, not a constant voltage on the output. So here, the voltage at the output on the load depends on the current that you take. So this is not a voltage regulator uh, but you may connect a voltage regulator at the output here and this voltage regulator may be uh, the Zener diode connection for example or it may be an integrated voltage regulator uh, that is also available as a component. The efficiency of this connection is given by the voltage drops that you have here on the diodes. I said that on a single diode we typically have during operation the voltage drop of roughly one volt. So in a half wave rectifier I have a voltage drop on a single diode so there's one volt here. but in the bridge rectifier, I always have two diodes connected in series, so I have one and two. So there is a, a larger voltage drop in this connection, simply we, because we have two diodes instead of one. If you want to have a, something really efficient, then uh, you need to use a DC-DC converter. A DC-DC converter is a more complicated connection uh, that uses transistors and diodes and inductors but uh, it has a larger efficiency. The efficiency of this kind of DC-DC converter can go up to 80, 90, 95%. So this is how it's done today typically. So instead of a simple connection. Uh, we have a really complicated connection with many many components but the result is that the device has high efficiency so it's not wasting too much energy. Um, how does it work? Here we see a connection that's called Buk and uh, it's a connection that always decreases the input voltage. So the output voltage here at the output is always smaller than the voltage at the input. So let's say this will be 15 volts and this will be 5 volts, for example. And we are using the properties of an inductor to maintain current in the circuit. And we are charging and discharging this capacitor. I will just run the simulation here to, to show, show you how that works. Uh, but the principle is the following. I 
turn on this transistor. I open that. We'll discuss the transistors later, but now let's say this is a switch. So I will open this transistor and the current will start to flow into the capacitor and it will charge the capacitor. So at stage one, the current is flowing like this and I'm charging the capacitor. So I'm storing energy in the electric field of the capacitor and at the same time I'm storing the energy in the magnetic field of the inductor. So if I would plot the voltage and current, so this would be time and this would be let's say Vc on the capacitor, we would see that the voltage on the capacitor is increasing, something like that. And the same would be for the current. The current would increase as an exponential function. So in stage one, I'm storing the energy here. In stage two, I will turn off this transistor and I will use the energy stored here and here to maintain the current into the load. So in stage two, the transistor is disconnected and the current flows like this. So the inductor tries to maintain the current in the circuit and it's using the energy stored in its own magnetic field for that. So the current is maintained, it's flowing now through the diode so that it's closed and it's flowing into the load. So I'm consuming the energy in the inductor and in the capacitor. So the capacitor voltage will now decrease something like that. And then it repeats. So I turn on the transistor, I charge everything, I turn it off and I discharge everything. Uh, the frequency of turn on and turn off can be quite high. Uh, it can be 50 kilohertz, can be 200 kilohertz and so on. So it's very, very rapid and the result is that this device uh, can use very small inductors and capacitors. So at the end it's very small and uh, it's very efficient because uh, you operate the transistor and the diode in on-off mode where you have small losses. So the efficiency of this kind of DC converters uh, can be up to 95, maybe 98 percent. Um, let's see a simulation uh, where we will see that. Well, it's still loading. Um, so that's this thing. Here I have an inductor and a capacitor. This is a DC power supply. So this typically comes from a rectifier that's in front of that. And here there's a transistor that will be controlled by a pulse voltage with higher frequency. And we'll look on the current and voltage that we have in the circuit. Now note that the capacitor value and inductor value is small. So physically there will be small components and this whole device will be quite small and efficient. So let's see. Um, the simulation takes longer um, because it needs to, yeah, I need to I'll run it for a longer time. Uh, let's say 50 milliseconds. Uh, because here you need to calculate for longer time and uh, now I have a 
bad scale somewhere. Yeah, let's go. Let's go back here. Uh, so this will be a single pulse. Uh, so you will see on and off of the circuit. So what you see here, uh, this is the current that is flowing in the circuit. It jumps rapidly to some value, and this is the part where you discharge, where you dissipate the energy in the circuit. Um, typically, it's uh, many of those pulses being repeated with a free with a very high frequency so uh, that's DC DC converters and uh, will not go through all types I have prepared more here um, but uh, I just want to show you uh, the efficiencies we'll discuss that uh, them in in more detail next week uh, but this is an example of uh, measured efficiency data uh, related to the CDC converters. Uh, so uh, you can see that the efficiency can be very high, 95% over here. You can see that the efficiency is a function of output current. So there is a point where you operate the in the converter in, in the most efficient way. So for example, of this circuit, for the connection used here, uh, the maximum efficiency point would be 200 milliamperes, for example. And the, the, there is a dependence between the output voltage at which you operate the circuit and uh, the efficiency. So here we see that for 1.05 volts, we have a low efficiency, but here for five so I'm sorry, the colors, uh, yeah, this is green, this is green, and here for five volts we have higher efficiency. So the efficiency, in fact, depends on the difference between the input and output voltage. If your step down ratio is large, if you want to convert from 12 volts to one volt, then you will have a smaller efficiency than if you're converting 12 volts into 5 volts. Um, another, another example uh, is shown here. Um, that's virtually the same, uh, the same chart, but for larger currents and for a different circuit. So just the type here is different. And still, the efficiency maximum point somewhere around here. 95%. So with this kind of circuit, it's nothing unusual to have 95% efficiency. And my question is, where do you think we find this DC DC converters? Exactly. So for example, this is a type of DC DC converter. It's not the Buick converter. It's called flyback. We'll discuss that next week. But it's a DC-DC converter. It is efficient. It is small. If it would be with a transformer, with a rectifier, with uh, a standard diode, then it would be like 10 times larger and heavier. And the efficiency would be 30%, so it would dissipate too much heat. Okay.